Going back to Eric Lehner's sayings of the big boy 45, wonderful version of the Jackson 5, was lost. Some will say lost is something that you could never find. And some will say that lost is something that uh, you don't know where it's, what, exactly where it's at or where it's at, but it's there somewhere. Lena's version was more like, if you ask me, it was there somewhere. Mr. Gordon Keefe, outlook on it was, how could something be lost if it was never lost? Meaning explanation of Eric's father, Ernie Lena, and his uncle, George Lena, did things hand in hand as at, at wonderful studios. They, they shared, or they had a record label, Mr. George, uh, Leaner ran the actual record labels. They had more than one Marvelous, Impact, and all all of those things. And Ernie was more of the, the business distribution side. Wonderful was a combination of a distribution and downstairs, if I'm not mistaken, and upstairs was the actual record label, or either or. You see, in 1967 of Ju June, I should know, July of 1967, July 13th of 1967, if I'm not mistaken, that's when the Jackson 5 were at Wonderful Studios recording I'm a Big Boy Now or Big Boy, which was uh, written by Mr. Eddie Silvers. Mr. Eddie Silvers um, also um, had a deal with uh, VAPAC, uh Publishings of VAPAC Music, and VAPAC was the, the entity that protected the, the song Big Boy. And uh, Silvers did a deal with him, a hand in hand deal with him. He got paid, so did the VAPAC, vice versa. But the reality part of it is Mr. Keat was the only executive record producer who put out Big Boy, or shall I say, who re recorded it. What Mr. Keefe did was he got a mechanical agreement from the brothers and he recreated his version of Big Boy from their existing version, which was a demo recording only. Yes, the Lena's version of Big Boy at Wonderful Records was only a demo recording only. What I mean by that, it was something that was never pressed into a record. Now, on the other hand, when Mr. Keat signed the Jackson 5s from the Leaners to his Steel Town label, he asked the Leaner Brothers if they had any recordings of the Jackson 5. And the Leaner Brothers' response to him was, no, they did not. Well, apparently somewhere down the line, Mr. Gordon Keith, I guess, went to Mr. Um, uh, Irani Jones and mentioned something about he had the Jacksons or whatever. And somewhere, somewhere, somewhere down the line, uh, a notion of the recordings came up, and I guess they must have told Mr. Keith, yes, they did have a recording on the Jacksons, which was Big Boy. So Mr. Keith went back and mentioned that, and that is how Mr. Keith was able to get a mechanical agreement between George and Ernie Lena, so that he could recreate the song Big Boy into his version. Mr. Keith's version of Big Boy was an upscale more of a throbbing beat. The wonderful version was a rehearsal version and it was a slow drag dag style that could be compared to um, a Motown, a Motown feel. Okay, uh, when the leaders were saying that uh, on their version uh, the Jacksons was not, it wasn't just Michael's voice but it was Michael and his brothers actually playing the instruments where they would state that on Mr. Keats' version, it was only Michael Jackson, and on some parts, possibly his brothers. But it was mostly with a, a, a grown-up uh, band that, that, that made up the rest of the, the, the song. But, again, when you look at Delina's version versus the Still Towns version of Big Boy, it was never lost. According to Mr. Gordon Keefe, Ernie and George Lena gave up on the Jackson 5. No one at that time wanted to invest in the Jacksons, and Ernie and Lena, like Ernie's son, Eric Lena said in this documentary, were shrewd businessmen, and I totally agree. Yes, they were shrewd businessmen. 
And because of that, it was more of the Lehman Brothers saw more of a turnaround of their investments into the Jackson 5 than anything else because no one wanted them. According to Mr. Keats, uh, sayings that the leaners gave up on the Jackson 5 and put their demo recording of their big boy version on the shelf. And that's where it stayed for over 45 years. Now let's go back to what Eric Leaner did in the November of 20, I'm, I'm sorry, of October of tw uh, the 28th of uh, 2014. He took that version of uh, the Jackson 5 Big Boy on Wonderful from the demo. Of course he had it uh, remastered at uh, some uh, Sonic Lodge in, in uh, New Jersey. He had it digitally remastered because the original uh, demo recording of their version was getting old or damaged or something. So he had it repaired or digitally remastered. Once it was digitally remastered it was sent back. When it was sent back then Eric apparently released it on a record label by the name of Secret Stash. Just recently, in October the 28th of 2014. But when you think about it, Eric did what his father and uncle should have done some 46 years ago. He did it recently. Okay? And another thing is the world does not know that Delina's version of the new version of Wonderful Big Boy was not the version that landed the brothers, the Jackson 5, a distribution deal with Atlantic Records and Atco Distributions on March the 5th of 1968. Mr. Gordon Keats version of Steel Town of the Big Boys did. And that's what people like uh, Rolling Stones who interviewed or took Mr. Dina's story is unaware of. And that's what anybody else is unaware of. Because it doesn't seem like Mr. Eric Lehner is telling that. It doesn't seem like he's mentioning that. What I want to do is, I've always felt and believed that both songs are brilliantly done and you can't be compared. But what I want to see is just to make sure at the ending of this documentary to play the version of Mr. Keats uh, Big Boy Jackson 5 recording and then play the Lena's version of it and let the audience decipher or decide which version is a better version. Is it the Leaner, Ernie and George Leaner's, and now Eric Leaner's version of wonderful Big Boy um, Jackson 5 version better or of a different sound? Or is it that Mr. Gordon Keats' Steel Town Records version of the Jackson 5 Big Boy is of better, of quality and sound? Uh, we will play that uh, in through the parts of this documentary and you can comment on the YouTube page and tell us what you think about it. But, but again, I want to reinstate back on the lost of Steel Town. You have two beings saying that it was a lost recording. You have Ben Brown, um, Mr. Gordon Keith's ex Steel Town partner, who stated that it was a lost Steel Town recording. And you have the leaner, Eric Leaner, stating that it was lost. The Big Boy 45 was lost. Ben Brown's version of stating that it was lost was to cover up a lie. It was all manifest. That's the way how I look at it as a filmmaker. That was his version. The leaners, it's, it, to me, is it's a different way because according to Mr. Eric Lena, when he stated it, it was lost, meaning uh, this way is a meaning that it was somewhere, but they just didn't know. But what it really was, was, you mentioned, they mentioned Mr. James Austin, a writer for the Chicago Tribune or the Chicago Reader. James Austin is between uh, 45 to 50 years old or somewhere around that age. He falls in the same category of Eric Lehner uh, uh, when Eric Lehner's father uh, had the Jackson 5. Eric Lehner was only 5, 4 years old, unaware of he was later told about the Jackson 5 and that the Jackson 5 recorded at his father's and uncle's studio. So that puts uh, James Austin in the same category. So the question is, but when you hear them stated through Stash Records or wherever the wonderful version of Big Boy is out, it states that uh, James Austin notified Eric. Then Eric contacted his sister, Felix, Miss Phyllis 
uh, Lena Newkirk, and then she informed her or asked her husband, and her husband retrieved it. Okay? But in reality, James Austin got his information from the people that was there. It had to have been. Like Mr. Larry Blazingang, like Mr. Gordon Keith. Those are the individuals that knew about it. That's how James Austin was able to contact Mr. Eric Leonard looking for a lost 45 of the Jackson 5. To me, it just totally puts it like it was unknown, not lost, but unknown to Eric Leonard about the big boy 45 until James Austin notified him. But James Austin was able to notify Eric Leonard about it because of Mr. Gordon Keith. Mr. Gordon Keefe informed him of the Lost 45. That's how that came about. And I think that that will show that that's the best way of doing it, to explaining it. Coming back from a prior footage in regards to what I spoke to you earlier, uh, pertaining to that we were going to show you the wonderful records, leaner version of Big Boy that was recorded by the Jackson 5 versus the Gordon Keith Steel Town Records version of Big Boy that was recorded by the Jackson 5. Before taking you to Wonderful's version, I ask that the public as well as the world do not, by no means, by any means necessary, take this demonstration of an example of letting the public and the world decipher which one is a better version, which one is a different, unique version, as a defamation to the Leaner family. That is not my intent as a filmmaker as well as a director. Upon doing my research in regards to the unknown story, I thought that it was fair to the world as well as the public that they would know that there was one original songwriter for the big boy period and his name was Mr. Eddie Silvers. Out of that came two versions of his lyrics. Two versions meaning two styles of music. Tones, upbeats and things of that, of, of that nature. Which was the wonderful version of big boy the world may not have known that, as well as the Gordon Keith Steel Town Records version of Big Boy. The world may have not known that. So, by any means necessary, is my intent as a filmmaker, again, to defame or criticize or make fun of the Leaner's version, as well as towards taking offense to the Leaner family. I strongly just feel, as a filmmaker, my goal was to let the world know and I thought it was fair to the world and to be honest about it and let the world decipher which version of Big Boy do they think was a unique or better version. So now upon saying such, I take you into the wonderful records, Lena version of the Jackson 5 Big Boy record. Take a look. What do you think about the Gordon Keefe Steel Town Records version of the Jackson 5 Big Boy?
And now this concludes the uniqueness and differences of the wonderful records version of the Jackson 5 Big Boy recording or record versus the Gordon Keith Steel Town Records Big Boy Jackson 5 record. I ask that you leave your comments on which song of his uniqueness and our differences on my YouTube page under the Gordon Keefe untold story of the Jackson 5 lost recording. Thank you. To Rolling Stone and Rolling Stone magazines. I as a filmmaker would like to know what do you think about the Lena version of the big boy uh, record as well as or to say if you even have known that there was another version other than what was presented to you by Mr. Eric Lehner, the son of Ernie Lehner. Were you ever aware that there was a Gordon Keefe uh, version of Big Boy? Were you also aware, Rolling Stones, that there was a version by Stilltown Records, Mr. Gordon Keefe of Big Boy? Mr. Rolling Stone, or should I say Rolling Stone, did you also know that Mr. it was Mr. Keith Stilltown Records version of Big Boy that landed the Five Brothers a distribution deal with Atlantic and Atco Distributions in January of 1968? That was the song, or should I say that was the version, the Gordon Keith Stilltown version of Big Boy that led the brothers to a distribution deal as well as recognition. Not the Lena version at Wonderful Records, Big Boy. Rolling Stones, are you also aware that it was n not the Lena version of Big Boy at Wonderful Records, which was a demo that got attention and recognition in 1968 of January? It was Gordon Key's version of Big Boy on, under the Still Town Records label. You see, Rolling Stones, the Lena brothers, Ernie and George Lena, had only did a demo, a rehearsal demo. From a rehearsal demo, the next option is to press a record from that. The wonderful version that was presented to you by the son of Ernie Lena, Mr. Eric Lena, had never seen the dawn of a day until 46 years later. That version of Wonderful Records was a demo version, rehearsal version, shall I say, that was put on the shelf for 46 years. Just recently, in the last year of October, around between October 26 to 28, Eric Lehner, the son of Ernie Lehner, put out that demo that was never been pressed into a record recently into a record under Wonderful and released under his record label, Secret Stash an Indiana record label in which Mr. Rolling Stones, or shall I say in which Rolling Stones, Eric Lehner did what his father and uncle Ernie and George Lehner should have done some 46 years prior. Thank you. Uh, my goal is, as uh, of this documentary, the Gordon Keefe untold story of the Jackson Five, um, Still Town Lost Recordings. I, I thought it would be very detrimental to kind of, you know, create an environment to show the viewers um, that with everything that we say in this documentary and show in this documentary, that we could totally back it up, confidently, totally back it up by um, revealing um, step by step court. Uh, documentations, legal documentations provided by Mr. William Adams, especially uh, the one um, Ben Brown uh, deposition one, to show where, uh, for, first of all, to show how Ben Brown was being deposed and uh, in the areas of how he was lying, and then go back and provide the, doc the proper documentation that was given to me by Mr. Keefe to show the viewers that Ben Brown was saying one thing, but we had uh, papers and documentation showing another thing that would possibly be making him a total liar. And uh, along in this documentary, just to be able to show how many times uh, Ben Brown attempted to fraudulent uh, Mr. Keith, to uh, pretty much produce fraudulent actions 
uh, against Mr. Keith or to Mr. Keith. Um, so yeah, so um, I'm just hoping that, um, especially again through the Ben Brown deposition documentation, that the viewers were able to be able, would be able to see uh, the evidence against Mr. Ben Brown that he was yes a steel town, uh, a former steel town uh, partner, um, and show ever since the very beginning, like in 1968 of January. As a matter of fact, 1968. Uh, January 31st when Mr. Gordon Keefe uh, pressed out to, at a steel um, Willow Springs uh, record pressing uh, company uh, 45's of Big Boy of the Big Boy 45 Ben Brown even then like around February went back asked Mr. Gordon Keefe for a copy of the roster we figure why so he can go back to Willow Springs like Mr. Keefe did portray that he was the manager of the Jackson 5 so that he can go and print out more copies that, like Mr. Keefe did. And from that, he went and found one of the Michael Jackson's relatives, um, Ethel uh, Wilbon Edwards. She was only 16 years old, and he manipulated her. And um, for his own greed, he went out to actually promote Big Boy, the Big Boy song, for money. Uh, and um, again, manipulating... Uh, Ethel Wilbons. Um, so th that was one thing he did. Um, he got along with Joe Jackson ever since the very beginning to befriend Mr. Keith, but in a sly way. You see, Ben Brown was more of a kind of guy that was like a, a con artist, and he could he had ways of s swooning you in and befriending you, and befriending you with a motive. He had a motive while he was befriending you. Uh, that, was, that, that, that was the kind of individual Ben Brown was. That's exactly how he was. And uh, from that point on, um, how he um, went after Mr. Keats, how he tried to get Mr. Keats' uh, 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 recordings, the, the, the reels, and, and, and how he was persistent with that, and how he never stopped, and how he was successful uh, with inverted records and Brunswick records for the wrongfully uh, transferring the, 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 the Jackson 5 compilations to those labels without Mr. Keith knowing, without his permission, how he was receiving uh, checks and things of that nature. You know, you had all of those things that Ben Brown was doing ever since the beginning. And then, on top of that, going on Inside Edition, uh, portraying that he uh, lost... Uh, I mean that he was the f that he, that he discovered the 45 or the the Still Town Lost recordings of the Jackson Five, and then going on Entertainment Tonight and doing the same thing. Uh, another thing that 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 disturbs me, or, 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 or I just wonder, why didn't Inside Edition and Entertainment Tonight take the time to interview Mr. Brown, to uh, have him provide? Uh, documentations and information revealing and showing that he was the uh, original discoverer of the Jackson fight. Why they did not do that? Because if they would have done such a thing, that then that would not have allowed Ben Brown to uh, go on national TV and lie. He went on national television and lied. So those that's the things that really, really disturbed me uh, and really, really got to me. Again, uh, that was very very uh, careless of such a uh, two big entities two big corporations and selfish of them to allow someone to go on national tv without interviewing them without doing the research and without making sure that this person uh, was who we say he was so inside edition and entertainment tonight again that was very wrong of you and that is another reason why i as a director um, i thought it would be, be best to expose you all in this uh, Still Town, um, this Gordon Key Still Town Untold uh, documentary of the Jackson Five. So, um, yeah, those those things uh, is what had me wondering. In this next contract, you will see when Ben Brown signs the deal between Brunswick and Inverted Records, which was a wrongful release of Gordon Keith's 13 song Jackson Five compilation. This was done in February 1st, 1996 between Brunswick Records, the President, Paul Turnpole, and Inverted Records, John Kenneth. Take a look. 
This is another affiliation with Ben Brown and Mr. John Kennett of Inverted Records. This is a second written contract modification and it was marked in 1996. It says the modification is made this 8th day of April of 1996 to the agreement dated February 1st, 1996 by and between Brunswick Entertainment Corporation. 1841 Broadway, New York, New York, 10023. Here and after, Brunswick and Inverted Records at 575 Madison Avenue, which is in New York as well. Here and after, of Record Company. A. The agreement dated on February 1996 between the parties is hereby modified to add two additional song titles to schedules A so that there are now a total of 13 songs titles hereby licensed to Brunswick from record company under under the same terms and conditions as are spelled out in the agreement about I mean dated in the agreement dated February 1st 1996 between parties hereunto the two additional song titles are as follows 12 let me carry your school books by Ripples and Waves plus Michael, recorded under the Steel Town Inc. record label. Thirteen. I never had a girl by Ripples and Waves plus Michael, recorded under the Steel Town Inc. record label. B. Record company has made no representation that either of the two above song titles or the sound recordings thereof which are the subject of this license agreement the feature performance of the Jackson 5 um, or Michael Jackson or that the recording group Ripples and the Waves consisted of any members of the Jackson 5 record company shall incur no liability and shall be fully indemnified by Brunswick for any statements of representatives made by Brunswick contrary to the preceding sentences it says uh, number two, in consideration for the modification of paragraph one, here above, Brunswick has made to the record company a re recoupable but non-refundable advance payment of fifteen hundred. Uh, was one thousand five hundred dollars in cash, which payment shall be deemed an advancement advance against royalties becoming due under the February 1st 1996 agreement this advance payment is made for the rights acquired by Brunswick under this modification dated April the 8th 1996 and is separate and distinct from may not be satisfied by a, collateral, uh, a collateralized which any advances made under this previous modification between the parties are dated March 29, 1996. The remaining provisions of the agreement dated February 1st, 1996 and the modification dated March 29, 1996 shall remain in full force and effect as it is fully set forth of lent herein. And it has here agreed to and accepted Brunswick Entertainment Corporation and it has the president's name here, Mr. Paul Tamapool, as president. Two inverted records showing and revealing John Kennett as president of inverted records. And this is Exhibit C. And uh, again, this is a final phases of what Ben Brown did. Got paid from inverted records. Gave inverted records all of Mr. Keith's material. 10 to 12 songs, 10 to 13 songs including the Ripples and Waves, two songs, in, a, in addition of others. True Inverted Records, and the Inverted Records, of, of course, was going to be its distributor. I mean, was going to pass it on for Brunswick Records to be its distributor, leaving Mr. Ben Brown to get paid. That was the motive, and that was the goal of Ben Brown. And as you could see, if you, as you have seen in the prior... Uh, uh, documents that I've read to you especially with Michael Jackson's attorneys uh, uh, Levy and Singer informing Ben Brown to refrain from any of the Steel Town recordings and you have seen 
how this Ben Brown has been persistent to push the envelope to still get Mr. Keith's music transferred over to Inverted Records then to be distributed through Brunswick. You've seen the evidence and I'm pretty sure I'm hoping that this is proof uh, I'm, I'm hoping that also that this could lead to uh, 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 Mr. Ben Brown uh, being brought back to the courts, uh, especially lying uh, to the courts during deposition by stating that or uh, portraying that he was Mr. Gordon Keith and that he was on the contract, on the original contract, the original Steel Town contract between Joe Jackson, Jackson 5, and Steel Town Records. In this next documentation in regards to Ben Brown, we have the Ben Brown deposition where it states the United States District Court for the Northern District of Indiana Mr. William Adams aka Gordon Keefe the plaintiff versus Michael Jackson and the Jackson 5 Brunswick Records, Inverted Records and Ben Brown the case number is 297 C as in Charlie B as in Victor 00141 in this deposition, Mr. Ben Brown is being deposed by Mr. Forty and Mr. Reed. In this deposition, Ben Brown lies numerous times pertaining to uh, have he ever entered an agreement with the Jackson 5 and Steel Town Records, um, pertaining to uh, that his signature was on the Steel Town contract uh, involving the Jackson 5 amongst other Steel Town uh, representatives. Um, and uh, many more things. I will also include a copy of the original Steel Town uh, Jackson 5 contract between Steel Town and the Jackson 5. And I will guarantee you that there's nowhere in that contract of Ben Brown's signature. Take a look. Here we have the Ben Brown deposition exhibit, which is other, also known as Exhibit J. Here we have Exhibit J. The Ben Brown Deposition. Uh, Esquires. In the next document of proof pertaining to Ben Brown, we have here the Ben Brown Inverted Records Contract. This is the contract where Ben Brown poses as Steel Town Records Executive Gordon Keefe. This is the contract that Ben Brown uh, transferred, wrongfully again transferred, all of 13 of Mr. Gordon Keefe's Jackson 5 compilations, including Big Boy, including I Never Had a Girl, including Let Me Carry Your School Books. Yes, this is the contract between Mr. Ben Brown and Inverted Records where Mr. Ben Brown uh, wrongfully transferred the music to Mr. John Kennett of Inverted Records. In addition to this, you will also see, or shall I say, into, I will throw in copies of um, checks that Mr. John Kennett issued to Mr. Ben Brown for the exchange of the Jackson of the 13 song Jackson 5 compilation from Steel Town Records. Now, what I really want to say also pertain to this, when you look at Ben Brown, and when you think of him, he's a deceiver, he's a manipulator. And everything about him is that. So if that's the case, then everything around him and anything that's affiliated with him is going to be the same thing. Full of lies, conception, and deceit. You see, what it is is, Mr. John Kenneth of Inverted Records and Mr. Ben Brown they knew that Mr. Gordon Keefe didn't have any money they knew this so that's why it was easy for them to do what they were doing and to do what they did again they knew that Mr. Gordon Keefe did not have any money to go after them for these wrongful things and again these things was done behind Mr. Gordon Keefe's back without his knowledge and without his permission here we have here what appears to be an adamant between Ben Brown and uh, Mr. Kenneth, uh, John Kenneth. 
This seems to be an atom between Mr. Ben Brown and John Kenna. And it states, uh, I, Benjamin Brown, individually as president of Steel Town Records, residing at 12368 Stonegate Road, uh, Pacomia, California, at 91331, for good and valuable consideration, the receipt of which is hereby acknowledged, hereby licensed to inverted records, a division of summer communications, the sound recording copyrights, and all such other rights of any nature into the master recordings, including the sound recordings and the tangible medium on which they were originally fixed and the medium on which they are fixed um, thereafter by Steel Town Records of Ripples and Waves plus Michael performing the compositions entitled Let Me Carry Your School Books and I Never Had a Girl on the same terms and conditions as the contract between myself and Inverted Records a division of Summer Communications which is dated December 17th of 1994 and we have here Mr. Ben Brown's signature here which is dated the three month 28 of 96 this was the third month 28 of 96 uh which was i want to say like uh two months uh before ben brown had these checks that he was uh, wrongfully uh, in charge of and signing accepted and it says accepted inverted records a division of summer crops then you have here mr john kenneth's Signature is the president and CEO of Inverted Records, and that too is marked is marked at that date, the third month, twenty eight ninety six. And we will go back on the back of the amendment. I this will be page two. Agreement made this seventeenth day of December, nineteen ninety four, between Inverted Records, a division of Summit Communications Inc., located at five seven five Madison Avenue, Suite ten zero six, New York. It states, um, where here is the license is interested in exclusively licensing all the rights into the master recordings owned by licensor, currently entitled Big Boy, recorded by Michael Jackson and the Jackson Five on Steel Town Records, which include, or which include uh, compositions as listed on schedule A attached onto. Hereafter referred as masters and licensor desires to license, transfer, and assign any and all licensors' rights thereto. Where there is licenses, will license to all rights, including copyrights, to the master recording from licensor. Now, therefore, is agreed as follows that it is in consideration of the mutual pro uh, promises here, herein contained. And for the other good and valuable consideration, the parties agree as follows. A. Licensee has already paid licensor the sum of $1,000 and agree to pay licensor an additional sum of $4,000 upon ex acceptance by licensee of the master tape. No payments for royalties here onto will be paid until after licensee has the first recouped uh, the amount paid to licensor hereon for the royalties otherwise payable to licensor. B. Subject to the licensor compliance with its allegations, uh, with with its obligations hereunder, and except to otherwise provide herein a license, will pay licensor for the rights granted herein forty percent of the net income actually received by licensee from its distribution exploitation exploitation of the recordings after first deducting any direct expenses of costs including manufacturing and promotion uh, notwithstanding any to the contrary of contained here on licensee shall pay for the royalty pay, pay said royalty directly to licensor licensor agrees that he shall be responsible for paying any other parties including Gary Rivo producers from the royalty. C. Royalties due licensors shall be com computed upon all the same terms, um, conditions, and adjustments, including by all way of illustration 
and not limitation. Payment on less than $100 of sales reductions for singles, discount of free goods, is produced rates for foreign tapes, a club sales, provision uh, respecting res uh, reserves and other liquidation, etc., as shall be used by licensees, distributor, and calculating licensees' royalty. Now, this is an agreement again between Ben Brown and John Kennedy of Inverted Records. As you can see, apparently I showed you the four thousand dollars that Ben Brown did receive from Mr. John Kenneth uh, from Inverted Records uh, on a date of twelve month the eighteenth two thousand I mean of nineteen ninety four. Uh it was received on two thousand I mean of nineteen ninety four, that's correct. And has on the last thing page if I was thinking it's page page three of their amendment between Benjamin Brown and Mr. Um, John Kennedy of Inverted Records. I Benjamin Brown individually and as president of Steel Town Records residing at Stonegate Road. It states receipt in which hereby is acknowledged hereby um, to inverted records, a division of Summer Corporation, the sound recording, copyright, and all such rights of any nature in and to the master recordings, including the sound recording and the tangible medium in which they were originally fixed and medium and fixed and in any mediums on which they were fixed therefore after Steel Town Records of Michael Jackson and the Jackson 5 performing the composition entitled Tracks of My Tears on the same terms and conditions as a contract between myself and Inverted Records a division of Summer Communications dated December 17, 1994 and we have here again Mr. The signature of Mr. Benjamin Brown, along with his supposedly uh, being president of Steel Town Records, accepted inverted by inverted records, and you have Mr. John Kenneth's signature here. Again, this is totally illegal here. This is totally illegal here. And then they would have the audacity to go on Inside Edition and Entertainment to Ben Brown to claim that he is the one who um, found the missing uh, 45 of Big Boy. This is really illegal here. This again is something pertaining to Ben Brown um, selling in the process of selling Mr. Keats, uh, about 10 of Mr. Keats songs to inverted records to Mr. John Kenneth. Um, here it seems to be it's coming from a CSTMCS Productions. It uh, looks like it's somewhere from Van Nuys, California, and it has something to do with uh, working capital management account. And it looks like it's a to pay to the order of Mr. William Adams, uh, uh, attorney Tom Lewis, two thousand five hundred dollars. Uh, and so, of course, you see that it's Marilyn Lynch, affiliated with Bank One. And it has, it appears to have uh, the person at Bank One's signature along with Mr. Ben Brown's signature here. Uh, and as you can see, state that uh, Mr. Keith never uh, cashed or signed, this was never cashed or signed by Mr. Gordon Keith William Adams, Mr. William Adams. This shows that Ben Brown was portraying a presidential role in where apparently Mr. Keith did not have to be there uh, to get these uh, checks and things of that nature. Again, this is to, to defy how Ben Brown was a manipulator, how he was a liar, a deceiver, and a con artist. This is total evidence to portray that. I mean, I mean not to portray that, but to reveal that. And uh, this is exactly what we're doing in this Gordon Keefe untold story of the Jackson 5 lost recordings. Uh, again, this is the check that has Mr. Keefe is paid to the order of Mr. William Adams um, pertaining to his attorney for the amount of $2,500 from Merle Lynch 
and again it has Ben Brown's signature on it. It should have Mr. Gordon Keefe's signature on it. If a check is written out to Mr. Gordon Keefe, then why shouldn't it be his signature there? This is totally not Mr. Gordon Keefe's signature here. This is Ben Brown. Ben Brown was a member of Steel Town Records. And this is some 25 years estimated uh, after uh, 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 um, the Jackson 5 left Mr. Gordon Key's label. Uh, you can see apparently by that time Ben Brown was had no affiliates really with Mr. Gordon Keefe or his still town establishment. But again you do see the dates here it appears to be the first month of the tour is 26 of 1994 when this occurred here. Okay. And what else do we have here? And then on the back again you can see what I showed you prior again. Uh, receipts, Mr. Kennedy, inverted records, four thousand dollars per paragraph one a of the agreement, dated the twelfth month, seventeenth. And again, it has Mr. Ben Brown's signature here again. And this is coming from the desk of Ben Brown. Again, this man got four thousand dollars of selling Mr. Keith's material to John Kennedy of Inverted Records. Mr. Keith again was not aware of this Mr. Keith did not give Ben Brown any permission to such involvement Mr. Keith did not engage in any agreement for uh, Ben Brown to, to transfer his music over to Inverted Records so you're probably wondering if Ben Brown was not to discover the Jackson 5 or uh, he didn't actually stumble across uh, lost recordings well, how was he able to uh, do a deal with Inverted Records by converting over the Jackson 5 uh, song, 13 song compilation from Mr. Gordon Keefe, along with the same thing with Brunswick Records? How could he have done such a thing? You probably may be asking. Hmm. Well, first of all, um, what he did was. You see, there was a man by the name of Mr. Jerry Williams. Mr. Jerry Williams had a, um, a record label. The record label was uh, by the name of SDEG Records. Uh, Mr. Keefe gave Mr. Jerry Williams the rights to use the Jackson 5 compilations like uh, I Never Had a Girl, well not the Jackson 5's, but like um, Big Boy, uh, Michael the Lover, and so forth and so on. Him and Mr. Keith, Mr. Jerry Williams and Mr. Gordon Keith worked out a deal sometime in 1989 when Mr. Keith gave him permission to use all of the material for a payout. So it could have been obviously uh, done that way. Ben Brown went behind Mr. Keith's back and worked a deal out with Mr. Jerry Williams to get the songs. Or he could have just purchased it. Once Mr. Jerry Williams put it out, uh, under the New Beginnings, if I'm not mistaken, the Jackson 5 material under the New Beginnings uh, record. Uh, ben Brown could have just went to the store, purchased the the album, and there it is. Now he has an ability to remaster or to replicate or copy uh, the Jackson 5 material. That explains the possibilities on how Ben Brown was possibly able to convert the, uh, the compilations to inverted records and along with um, Brunswick Records. That's the answer for that. That's that's how I see that. The next documentation is pertaining to Mr. Gordon Keefe of Steel Town Records. This is the Steel Town Jackson 5 Gordon Keith Atlantic Records Atco distribution deal. You see, this is the distribution deal that Mr. Gordon Keith had with Atlantic Records slash Atco distributions back in 1968. It was dated of March the 5th, if I'm not mistaken, and this is that that's what you will see on the contract. It was dated in March 5th. Now, this was being taken from the original Gordon Keefe Steel Town contract uh, via uh, affiliation uh, signed with the Jackson 5. 
convert it into the distribution. You see, with this uh, distribution contract, this is what paved the Jackson 5 the, the way I made them noticeable of the song Big Boy. And on the flip side, you've changed. Yes, this is the contract. This is the distribution contract um, that the Jackson 5, in, um, along with Mr. Gordon Keefe, signed with Atlantic Records. By, uh, along with a, uh, a Atlantic uh, executive by the name of Mr. Gerald Wexler. You will see his signature on that contract along with Mr. Gordon Keefe. And on that contract, nowhere on that contract, shall I say, do you see Ben Brown's signature. Now, if Ben Brown was um, the uh, discoverer or the president of the Jackson 5, okay, uh, on the actual Steel Town contract, like he stated that he was on, um, on the deposition, then you would also see Ben Brown's signature on this Atlantic Atco distribution. This distribution contract uh, is another thing to show that Ben Brown was portraying to be Mr. Gordon Keefe, was portraying, portraying to be the discoverer of the Jackson 5, in which that he lied being deposed by Mr. Fargo and Mr. Reed. Again, this contract that you will see, the Gordon Keefe Steel Town slash Atlantic Atco Distribution Jackson 5 contract, you will see nowhere on that contract Mr. Ben Brown's signature, making him a true and a total liar. So let's take a look at that contract and uh, you'll be the judge of that. This here is to really uh, bulletproof Mr. Keith as the original discoverer of the Jackson 5 and the executive producer Record, produce, record label producer of Steel Town of the Jackson Five, as well as the the one the, the the gentleman who had the distribution deal between Atlantic Records and Atco uh, distributions. If Ben Brown has signed anything like he stated, then where is his documents of proof, whether it's original or copies? And you will see, uh, in the in addition to this uh, uh, documentary here. We will reveal the original uh, Steel Town contract, revealing Mr. Gordon Keefe. He has it in a vault. We will be going with Mr. Keefe in a vault in Gary, Indiana, um, to show the world the original possessions, the original contract that Mr. Keefe had signed between the Jackson Five and Joe Jackson. And there is nowhere on that contract as well as Ben Brown's signature. This here again is a distribution contract between Mr. Gordon Keefe, a.k.a. Um, William Adams, and Atlantic Records and Atco Distributions. Where has Mr. Willie Adams at his Steel Town address at 1025 Taney Street? That is dated on March the 5th of 1968. And it pretty much starts off with this letter will set forth and construe constitute a binding agreement between here and after referred to as seller and ourselves here and after referred to as purchaser see as you go all the way through this thing here you see it you go all the way through it you see it and then I'm going to go on to the next page of course possible this is still the Atlantic distribution deal between Mr. Gordon Keith and Atlantic Records. Just going over all the procedures and things of that nature here. All these things here. See that there. And go to the second page. There. And you can even clearly see where it mentions seller warrants and represents that the artist known as the Jackson 5 are now and will continue to be under a valid exclusive contract as recording artists to seller, which will be Mr. Gordon Keith, for not less than three months. Da -da 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 -da. And it just keeps going. And it keeps going. And then all the way, right? I'm going to get to the bottom of it. Make sure you see that this is the bottom of it, okay? And, of 
course, getting down some nitty gritty here. It says what it says. And the final saying is if the foregoing is accordance in accordance with your understanding, please so indicate by signing below. Very truly yours, Atlantic Record Recording Corporation, Mr. Gerald Weckler. By Mr. Gerald Weckler. Weller, and you have agreed to by who? Mr. William Adams. Where again do you see Ben Brown? At nowhere. And this is a distribution deal, distribution contract with Mr. Uh, Gordon between Mr. Gordon Keith and Atlantic Records. And it has what? Songs on it. Of course. Title, artist, big boy, the Jackson 5, you've changed. Those are the two songs. And these are the same, these are some of the songs, these are the songs, again, that Ben Brown transferred over to Inverted Records and Brunswick. And back to the distribution. Either that is, again, that is uh, marked March 5th, 1968, Mr. Willie Adams. 1025 Taney Street, Gary, Indiana, 46404. Ben Brown is totally a liar, and I hope you all could see that. And I hope that I did my best to expose it. Thank you. The next courthouse documentation you will see is the Stilltown Records contract between Mr. Gordon Keith and the Jackson 5. On this contract, this is the very first contract that Mr. Gordon Keith signs the Jackson 5 to a six-month deal. It was dated in uh, November the 21st of 1967. This also is the contract where Ben Brown again lied upon being deposed by Mr. Fardy and Mr. Reed. You see, when Ben Brown was being deposed, he stated that his signature was on the Steeltown contract, Steeltown Jackson 5 contract, along with others, such as Joe Jackson, such as Mr. Gordon Keith. He also stated, while being the pose, that there was a two-page contract. Well, that was true. He stated that he was um, into business deals with the Jacksons pertaining to the contract, and that is not true. So on this contract, which you're about to see, again, is the contract that was uh, created and made by Mr. Gordon Keith for his Steel Town record labels, um, involving the Jackson 5. You will only see, as Secretary of President, or as Secretary, Mr. Gordon Keefe, a.k.a. William Adams, and Mr. Joseph Jackson's signature. And also, this is, um, this is a copy of the contract where in the documentary, uh, in this documentary, of course, you will hear, in the very beginning, you, you, you heard, uh, shall I say, you heard Mr. Gordon Keefe stated that he keeps all his information in the vault, and that he has the original copy of that Steel Town contract of the Jackson 5 in a vault on onion paper. So, uh, again, this document reveals again that Ben Brown is a liar. And um, let's take a look at it. Okay, as we move along to the next documentation pertaining to Ben Brown. Hmm. Let's see the Inverted Records Company. Uh, shall I say, let's see the Inverted Records Dummy Company. And the, one of the reasons, uh, some of the reasons why I'm stating that I feel that it's a dummy company, and you'll uh, be the judge of that in a few minutes as you look at the, the uh, documentation, um, it's because under uh, registered agent, it's zero. Um, under the chairman of a uh, board, it's uh, zero. 
um, under the business um, location mm, it's zero so you tell me with all of these uh, zeros how could that be an establishment and also how could you uh, do a contract pertaining to Ben Brown and how could you be Mr. John Kenneth if uh, all of those things mount up to zero I'll tell you what I'll let you take a look at it and you tell me what you think about it The Johnny Jackson certified statement versus Ben Brown's claim. You see, I like uh, this certified documentation so much because this is actually Johnny Jackson, the member of the Jackson Five, uh, writing a certified letter stating that there is no way that Ben Brown is the original discoverer or the discoverer of the Jackson Five. In this certified statement, you will see that Johnny Jackson also is supporting Mr. Keefe and even witnessing that Mr. Keefe was the only discoverer of the Jackson Five and also that there's no one else that had any of the Jackson Five original recordings and material but Mr. Keefe because he stated that it was in a vault where Mr. Keefe always puts his belongings and you heard that also prior in this documentary that he stated his, Mr. Gordon Keith stated it himself that that is where he keeps and always have kept the Jackson 5 recordings and material so I mean this one I really endure because this is Johnny Jackson who was a member of the Jackson 5 years after after he left the Jackson 5 or was sent home to Gary from Joe Jackson uh, he got back with Mr. Keith and, uh, you know, uh, that was very, very nice of him to do that, to um, create a, a certified document that will back Mr. Keith as a witness and as um, the, a member of the Jackson 5. You will see in this, in this certified documentation by Johnny Jackson that he stands by Mr. Keith's side. And let's take a look at it. Ripples and Waves uh, copyright documentation. Uh, this is just a documentation to uh, show who is the copyright owners uh, for the two songs, Let Me Carry Your School Books and I Never Had a Girl. And uh, they are Mr. Gordon Keefe, William Adams, and of course his nephew, Mr. L.V. Woodard, which is one of the members and owner of the group, historical group, uh, the Ripples and the Waves plus Michael. So take a look at that. The next Steel Town Courthouse documentation is the Steel Town Records partner Willie Spencer certified documentation. This is documentation where you have Mr. Willie B. Spencer. Mr. Willie B. Spencer was a member of the, uh, well, one of the Steel Town partners of Steel Town Records back in 1966-67 and, and around that time. You had a list of, I want to say, five members if I'm not mistaken you had Mr. William Adams of course you had Mr. Maurice Rogers you had Mr. Lud Washington who was apparently a relative of, of Catherine Jackson supposedly uh, uh, Mr. Willie B. Spencer and of course Ben Brown in that whole function as all of those uh, guys are members of um, a still town uh, uh, corporation uh, they had worked out a deal where it was they used uh, Steeltown as a promotional kickoff 
uh, uh, kind of like a uh, thing where uh, each members had or agreed to get uh, had having their own acts. Like, of course, Mr. Keith was known to uh, have the Jackson Five and, and responsible for them. They uh, discovered them and managed them. Uh, ben Brown had uh, what you call the, the the Pace Twins or something of that nature, the, uh, the Pacel Twins. Uh, those are Ben Brown's acts along with other acts. Um, and they all agreed to come together uh, and if needed to help each other with the groups. But each individually uh, had control over who they agreed to have control over. So that right there shows you uh, exactly again where Ben Brown was lying as why he was stating that um, uh, he was the discoverer of the Jackson 5 and he was their manager. This documentation here the um, the Still Town Records uh, partner Willie B. Spencer certified documentation again it will prove to you that Ben Brown is a liar. Again all members all five members agreed uh, to having and using Steel Town Records Inc. as a kickoff label. It was a kickoff label in 1966 to 67, and a little bit longer than that. And all agreed, okay, to have their own individual acts, and they brought the acts to uh, Steel Town uh, when needed to promote them. But again, by not by any chance was any of them to have control over certain ones, uh, except for the ones that they agreed upon. Take a look at this documentation. courthouse documentation is the Steel Town Records versus Jackson 5 courthouse documentation. Hmm. The case number for this documentation is 103 C as in Charlie V as in Victor 00 844 D as in Donald F as in Frank H as in Henry dash V as in Victor S as in Sam and S as in Sam. And this is for all of you all uh, who would like to uh, look it upon yourself. You could take it from here and uh, Google it and you could see, I'm pretty sure, that uh, document will appear. But um, what I like about this documentation is it shows that Mr. William Keith, uh, along with his nephews, uh, a nephew, shall I say, Mr. L.V. Woodard, and the rest of the Ripples and Wave members, Versus all of the Jackson Fives, including Michael Jackson and all of his brothers, including Joe Jackson and Barry Gordy's um, Motown record label. Yes, you see, Mr. Keith took these individuals to court for wrongfully using his material, the Ripples and Waves material. Mr. Barry Gordy took it and uh, had a, um, a record released, uh, something, an uh, introduction to the Jackson Five Ripples and Waves. And you see also the Jackson Fives were once posing or pretending or claiming to be the Jackson, uh, the Ripples and Waves before they were known as the um, Jackson Five. So Mr. Keith took them to court for that purpose. And in this court documentation, you will also see that the judge ordered all of the brothers, all of the Jackson Five brothers, to pay Mr. Gordon Keith and the Ripples and Waves one third of any earnings that they had uh, gotten or received. Uh, from the introduction of Ripples and Waves. You see, it appears that they were all in on this uh, for their own greed. All of the Jackson brothers, Joe Jackson and all of them uh, were in on this for their own uh, deeds, along with Ben Brown. Uh, ben Brown also was affiliated with this. That's what this whole thing is all about. Uh, with Ben Brown doing the lost uh, Steel Town uh, recordings and things of that nature. Uh, and also, what's fascinating about it is Michael Jackson's record label, uh, MJ Productions, uh, uh, Brunswick Records, and Inverted Records were just like right across the street from each other. And uh, it was so strange that Lively and Singler, Michael Jackson's attorneys, 
uh, where he's yet sending Ben Brown uh, several letters and documentation for Ben Brown to refrain from using uh, and exploiting the um, Michael Jackson Steel Town Masters. But why didn't they uh, put a halt on? Uh, why didn't they stop Ben Brown if they if if they really uh, was against that? So again, I um, like this uh, Gordon Keith Steel Town Records versus. Um, the Jackson 5 courthouse documentation because he took the Jackson 5 to court again including Joe Jackson Motown Records of, uh, which is Barry Gordy for, for creating the introduction to Ripples and Waves without Mr. Keith's permission and for the Jackson 5's using the Ripples and Waves name uh, saying that again saying that they were once the Ripples and Waves before they were known as the Jackson 5 um, just take a look at this documentation and you'll see for yourself The Levy and Singer Michael Jackson Attorney contract or documentation. In this documentation, you will see that Michael Jackson attorneys uh, have made several attempts by sending Ben Brown many letters, a total of like around eight letters, um, telling him to refrain from solicitating and exploiting the Michael Jackson Steel Town recordings. Letting him know, letting Ben Brown know that um, Michael Jackson himself was not interested in any of his new endeavors or new ideas or, or pertain to uh, the Still Town release or the Lost Still Town recordings. But Ben Brown never um, stopped. He, it, you will see that uh, he was constantly persistent and totally determined. In portraying that he was the president of Steel Town Records, that he had all of the material pertaining to the Jacksons' uh, uh, material, and that he discovered uh, the lost uh, 45, or shall I say, the lost record, or the uh, the Steel Town recordings. Again, in this uh, documentation, which is the Lavely and Singer Michael Jackson attorney. Uh, documentation you will see in a second uh, where again his Michael Jackson attorneys is consistent and persistent with informing Ben Brown that they are not along with Michael is not interested in the Michael Jackson Steel Town recordings let's take a look at it Hello everybody, I'm just here to let you all know I've been working with Purity Boy Films Incorporation and uh, so far he, I can tell you that he's very very passionate about his work and uh, so far he did a magnificent job on bringing uh, the information to the public about how Mr. Uh, Gordon Keith has been mistreated by the Jacksons for years and years and so far he's getting a great redo of his work and uh, so far I'm going to have to get Mr. Kenneth Joseph a name. He's done a great job on um, directing and getting all the information out to the public about Mr. Gordon Key. And I want to thank you all. Y'all have a blessed day. Wow.
Thank you. I want all the musicians to strike Hey, Kenneth Joseph, my dear friend. Uh, he's CEO, right, Chief Executive Officer, and also owner, right, of Pretty Boy Films, Inc. What is it like working on the set? Well, it's plain and simple. There's never a dull moment, okay? It's always exciting. And the guy's a wizard, right, at bringing out the best out of you, okay? So that's how it is for me working with Ken. And cut. Very good, Jinx. It has been a pleasure working with Pretty Boy Productions with the director, Mr. Kenneth Joseph, and his team. I've learned a lot and we've explored a lot to try to help Mr. Gordon Keith be discovered in the world as far as being the founder of the King of Pop. And Mr. Joseph is, has a passion for this and he's going to see this project out to the end and we've been working together and we want to continue to see this out that Mr. Gordon Keith get his just dessert. So I wish Mr. Kenneth Joseph the best with his product. And he's been doing a good job, and this is his baby, so that's all I have to say. We're uh, in action. And at the same time, here we go, 14, 15 years later, Benjamin Brown returned, needing my help again. So he came on my job, and I worked at the Blackstone Bar and Grill on 5th and Madison. And it was a police-owned place. So this particular day, since he worked for the city, they basically knew Benjamin. So they, he asked my bosses, could he speak with me? So they closed the kitchen down, shut it down. So Benjamin and I... We're going too much into the story oh, of it. Okay. See, that's we don't want to go into that's okay. Okay, no. just state about right. when I'll, he came back. I'll just reinstate it again. What I love about you, Eric, as far as this is you're very honest with what you're saying. And everything is right on the money. Um, that's to me, that's how I looked at it as because they all had something in common. You had Barry Gordy with WVON, with E. Rodney Jones at WVON, with Perver Span at WVON when your your dad and uncle they were all they all had the connection because they were well shrewd if one called that businessmen where they they never seen nothing per it's business yes. and, and that's how they that's how they became it's like all you guys but like relatives like but not really relatives but connected because of that same thing so wow so it's just amazing give me an overall whatever Jake was about mr keith First off, go with your, your role, your position, your title. That's how we're doing it. In action. Hello, my name is Mervyn William Jenkins. I'm a co-owner of Pretty Boy Films, Inc. Uh, my role dealing with this Okay, and cut. Get out of your nose. Get out of your nose, man. Okay. Yeah, I can't hear you breathing. You're muffling like, what, what the hell are you saying? Action. Run that question. <laughs> uh, give us some insight on that and uh, about uh, Inside Edition. Okay, before you start, okay, I'm going to do the Inside Edition part. What I'm going to say is how it opened up for us to further investigate the truth is according to Mr. Gordon Keith. Alpha can deal with the rubble part. Okay, as that's as good. As, okay, so I'm just going to make mine as briefly as possible, whereas, you know, to make it the poignant that Mr. Keith has a case now. So right. I got you. Let's go.
Baby.